Hello. My name is Amy Guerin, Contributing Editor with Healthcare Dive. I'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar, How to Improve Electronic Medical Record Use in Your Healthcare Organization. During today's webinar, we will explore the challenges and opportunities of electronic medical records, including how your staff can use this technology to its fullest potential. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping items. If you have questions, please send them to our speaker during this webinar using the Q&A box on your screen. We'll answer a few questions at the end of the webinar. Answers to any remaining questions will be sent to you later by email. We will also send an email with instructions for accessing the on-demand recording of today's webinar. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Tom Tonkin is Principal of Change Management and Transformation Thought Leadership and Advisory Services at Cornerstone On Demand. Tom, I'll pass this over to you. Thank you, Amy, and I appreciate everybody tuning in today to today's webinar. Um, I think we have something very special in store for you, and I look forward to walking you through some of the ideas around EMR and what we can do to increase adoption. In today's agenda, we have three areas that I want to cover. The first is understanding the significance of EMR as it is not only in the past, we have to understand a little bit of its history, but also how important it has become to the criticality of good patient care. The second is the current challenge that we are faced with is the lack of adoption of EMRs specifically about uh, on physicians and other clinicians as well, and then obviously address some of the solutions that we can apply uh, to increase that adoption. And lastly, I'll wrap up with some conclusions and some takeaway points for you to consider uh, as you go back to your hospitals and institutions. I think first we have to have a discussion or an understanding of what medical records are today and where they came from. I'll be referencing a study that was commissioned by the NIH uh, a few years ago, specifically uh, trying to address the challenges of the lack of adoption of these systems. I added a definition of what electronic medical records are from this particular study. And you'll see that I highlighted this idea that the medical records that we talk about today are information, clinical information about individual patients. I think if you rewind the clock a little bit in this space, you'll find out that medical records were intended to be more administrative. They were billing and other types of materials in such a way. But as we move into this more collaborative, uh, specialized healthcare landscape, medical records have turned into what's called electronic health records. It's a little bit of a nuance, but it does change the flavor a little bit as it pertains to pointing to what is critical. So in the past, it was medical records in the sense of not only a little bit about the patient, but also their billing history, like I said earlier. Health records, and by the way, these acronyms are interchangeable, health records suggest that we're now keeping track of the individual and where they are in their health. There are several reasons uh, for this change. One of them is as more research in the health field, and, and I'm talking diseases and cures continue to exponentially grow. I mean, technology has moved us forward so quickly that it's given us an opportunity to gain exponentially more information, so much more that clinicians, whether it be physicians, nurses, or anybody that actually touches you as a practitioner, is starting to become more and more specialized. 
this is a good thing for the patient, but also puts an extra burden on the medical community because now specialized practitioners don't necessarily have a holistic view of who you are and your medical history. Thus, these health records become an essential part of your care. So I'd like to leave you with that particular uh, thought, but there's even a more drastic and important reason for getting this right. This particular chart comes to us from various sources, and you can see the reference in this one. The real big takeaway for this particular chart, and a chart that happens to be published every single year, is the third leading cause of deaths in this country is medical errors, which means is every single one of them can be preventable. To me, it's almost a social responsibility for us to take the significance of electronic health records to consideration. If you then take a look at how this all divides out, basically 58% of these uh, break out into two different categories. 27.6% of this is due to negligence, while 19% is due to drug complications. The idea about that is these are very preventable, and most of that, those challenges come from the fact that health records aren't necessarily shared or they're accurate or accurate enough for the situation. For example, maybe somebody didn't process a procedure that they should have because it wasn't documented earlier. Uh, I think it's important also to note that there are things that people know and that people don't know. Also, the drug interactions. And so if you do the math in your head very quickly, you're talking about over 100,000 deaths a year. And the, and the number varies from year to year, uh, but, but it's always the third leading cause of death in the country. And, and I, I just, uh, I don't know if you've uh, sort of rationalized in your mind like I have. And it's just, uh, it's just something that I think us as a healthcare community uh, must address. And to make my point, I, I like to give you a, a very real and recent story. This is Leilani Schweitzer. Leilani was the mother of a young child, Gabriel. He was about 20 months old. Gabriel had all sorts of complications as an infant. Many times the doctors were unable to understand his health considerations. Leilani found herself with Gabriel in a hospital attached with cables, fighting for his life. Anytime Gabriel's numbers or his heart would fail, alarms throughout the hallways would ring out loud, and certainly Leilani would be awake, of course nervous as a mother, trying to figure out what's next. The nurse saw Leilani sitting next to Gabriel, very, very tired, and suggested to her, maybe what I'll do is turn off the alarm next to your bed, see if you can get some sleep. Leilani, of course, thought that was great, and of course the nurses would continue to monitor, monitor Gabriel's situation. What happened was a very tragic incident. Not only did the nurse turn off the alarm in by her bedside, but also turned off the alarms everywhere else. Gabriel went into cardiac arrest. The alarms did not go off, and shortly thereafter, Gabriel passed away. Unknowingly, the nurse had turned off all the different screens and the alarms of this particular technology. The manufacturer 
did not realize that this was a problem and never put a fail safe in place and the nurse was not properly trained and we lost Gabriel it's a very tragic example of lack of training lack of understanding of what it is that makes the difference between life and death for those that are more interested in the story Leilani goes uh, completely into the details and the outcome on a TED talk that she gave to us all and so we need to continue to consider this part of medical uh, of, of the medical community very important as it pertains to people's lives and we still have a challenge and, and that challenge is a challenge of adoption going back to that study that I highlighted earlier we see that we are gaining positive results as it pertains to the utilization of EMR systems in the medical practice but yet that adoption rate across the medical community specifically physicians and different practitioners is still not to the point of full optimization there's still a wonderful opportunity for us to continue to gain on these medical errors the problem is that we can't sustain these challenges we must overcome them we must do something different let me give you a few numbers for your edification I think it's important for us to understand that physicians nurses did not get into this business of taking care of people to sit behind the computer screen and document everything they do however in a recent report coming out of the University of Wisconsin it's been reported that out of an 11 hour workday which is usually that shift 44 percent of that was documenting whether it be people's conditions but also billing and coding and all sorts of other things I think this puts a tremendous amount of pressure undue pressure should I say to those that want to be with their patients and care for them this should be more routine this should have uh, a, a, a feel of greater level of of integration to the workflow and what I mean by the workflow is it should be organic within the way clinicians take care of their patients and you can imagine that resistance that comes from physicians and others when you feel as if you're being more of an administrator and a lot less of someone that's taking care of patients it's very real and and I think you can all relate as employees of your particular organizations to maintain focus on the mission of what it is that you're trying to do when arguably you feel as if you're not self-fulfilled in the work that you're trying to achieve and I think this is probably the number one reason why we are lack of the adoption however in this same report which by the way I, I a point about this report this report is what's called a meta-analysis so it's an analysis of all the different analysis it's a it covers hundreds of different research uh, documents um, keywords that are found online and and, and and basically abstracted to have a overall perspective on this adoption challenge and this particular report gave us the top 25 challenges in physician adoption of EMR the slide in front of you is a summarization of the 25 areas that physicians raise as challenges in adopting EMR systems so I took the the opportunity here to just do a cut and paste right out of that report and give you a, an overall view and and as you scan this list 
you can quickly see that we're kind of all over the place. We're talking a little bit about lack of time, high costs. We're certainly talking a little bit about computer literacy issues. Um, and it really just uh, spans the gamut of different challenges. I think part of these might be rooted in what I said earlier about the frustration that physicians and clinicians overall have in EMR, meaning the EMR aspect that takes so much away from their patient care. But at the same time, these are very real. And as those that are trying to adopt EMR technology in such a way that is helpful, I think it's important for us to address uh, the challenges. So what I decided to do is read the report in detail and through some cursory textual analysis, provide you a lens to guide your perspective as potential solutions to some of these challenges. What I decided to do is go through each of these topics in detail and assign a category, a solution category for each one of these. And what I found interesting was that we really have two challenges or, or potentially challenges that have solutions. One of them is training issues and the other one are operational issues. The way I define training is exactly that information gathering, uh, the ability to motivate those through information, uh, everything that you might consider a traditional training uh, example uh, would fit into that definition here. And the other one is that of operations. Operations would be setting up the processes and procedures correctly, making sure that we have a mission and vision to guide us through. So let me just give you some quick examples. In this case, the first one you see at the top left says time. I identify that as operations. If you look at time specifically, in essence, the physicians are saying, well, we don't have enough time to do the training. We don't have enough time to learn the system or even utilize the system. This is an operational issue because we need to set it up as a priority. This now has to be their job. This now has to be viewed as how we can take care of a patient in a, a, a highly qualified way. We are now arguably in the year 2018 and technology is making a difference in people's lives. And so this now has to become a process that is prioritized. And no amount of training is really going to, to fix that uh, other than how administrators in institutions uh, move that forward. Now, on the other hand, you will see things like uh, absence of computer skills at the top right. Well, absence of computer skills in the, in the year 2018, I, I think, is, is truly a training and motivational issue. There's absolutely no reason why uh, anyone should be lacking computer skills uh, in our society uh, at this point in history. My goodness, uh, I, you know, I, I have technology all over the place, and and uh, I don't even know it anymore. Uh, as of recently, I've even installed new thermostats that are internet connected and that I can change the temperature from my phone. It, it's really pervasive through our entire lives and there's no reason why uh, the healthcare system isn't part of that. So in essence, we have two major themes to discuss. So as I mentioned in the previous slide, it appears that we have two pervasive themes uh, from the data. That of training issues or arguably training solutions, the meaning we're able to take care of some of those challenges through training, as well as some operational issues. Again, to recap, training are this traditional information uh, sharing as well as assessments, awareness, and all that goes with training and operations is more about how we administer processes and procedures uh, as well as prioritizations. But for this particular case, I want to address the use of training 
to increase the adoption of EMR solutions in that specific community of physicians, nurses, and clinicians in general. And so for that reason, I like to provide a big idea. So the big idea that I'm going to offer in this webinar is the way we would go about increasing adoption in EMR systems among clinicians is through training. Now I want to make sure that everybody understands that this is probably not the only way or not the exclusive way of increasing adoption. However, if we were to take a look at traditional training in other areas, specifically around compliance, we would see that there's a tremendous amount of gains. So it's fair for us to equate the idea of EMRs as uh, a compliance challenge as it pertains to adoption and that we know from other disciplines that training has done a tremendous job in increasing that adoption in those systems. Now, when rolling out, whether it be EMRs or the training for EMRs, we have to understand that there is a specific type of population that will take on that adoption. And for that, I reach out to Everett Rogers, who wrote the seminal book called Diffusion of Innovation back in the early 60s. And he came up with this profile of any population that's trying to adopt anything new. And we know that not everybody uh, is created equal as it pertains to any kind of technological adoption. Uh, for example, myself, uh, I, I enjoy my Apple products very much, uh, but I wouldn't necessarily consider myself one of those innovators that jumps on to the first and latest version. I like to see what's happening first and, and let other people work it out. I think it's fair to say that this particular challenge is also present in the adoption of EMRs within physicians. So to go through this very quickly, any given community of people that are trying to adopt technology, there are, in essence, five different subgroups. You have 2.5% of that entire population are innovators. Those are the ones that jump in head first. They enjoy the challenge. They enjoy the exclusivity that comes with being an innovator. You then move on to early adopters, about 13.5% of those, and they're the ones that are similar to innovators but have a little more greater level of judiciousness. Then we go to the early majority. Now, what's interesting is many of you might have heard this term, crossing the chasm. It's one that Gary Moore way back when coined. And crossing the chasm is this move from the early adopters as they adopt uh, technology to those early majorities. That's jumping the chasm. That's moving from what is scarcity, exclusivity on the left hand of that slide to the right hand of the slide is more about sort of that social proof. I want to see it working with somebody else. I want somebody else to figure it out before I get carried away in doing it myself. And I will, I will wait for that before I commit to adopting any new technology. Once you get to there, you get to the late majority, which basically says, look, I want to wait until at least half of the population is utilizing this on a, on a consistent basis before I sort of throw my hat in the ring. And then lastly, we have laggards, uh, about 16% of the population. And those are the ones that are, are what I call traditionalists, right? They, they, they value the, the history and, and the way things were done in the past. And so I'm going to, I'm going to make a, a suggestion here that, we have the same phenomena happening within our physicians. We have physicians that are innovators. Those that are willing to take on that new technology have the understanding, and we also have physicians that are early adopters. And I'm going to suggest 
that we don't necessarily have a complete clear view of how many physicians and clinicians overall are adopting uh, the technology of electronic medical records, but I'm going to suggest that those 16% are probably present. And though that's great, and that's 16% more than we had before, it's certainly not going to be optimal as we're looking towards moving the needle in helping patients uh, live a better, more comfortable life. We need to start chipping away at that early majority. So given that, I'd like to provide you a specific view at each of these uh, populations to, so you can create an adoption plan of your own that would help you move that transition from early adopters and innovators when you first implement TMR to the majority of your population. So I've given you a little greater level of detail here in this particular chart. Uh, it's a different representation of that curve. And I like to just walk through each one of you and uh, each of these and, and speak towards this. So let's talk with the innovators at two and a half percent, right? Those are the folks that uh, are considered to have the highest social status. What I mean by social status is somebody that you would think is in the know, somebody that has great levels of influence, somebody that is able to uh, garner the resources and the influence and, and the, the support they need to have their agenda come true. They also have social capital. Those are the folks that you ask favors and you ask for guidance and all sorts of other things like that. And they, they have a sensitivity to scarcity. They enjoy exclusivity. They like to be the first uh, people on the block to have the cool new thing. And they, they could be your friends when you're rolling out uh, a new EMR system. The, the challenge we have with innovators is they find themselves, uh, those are the ones that tend to learn on their own. They're the ones that try to fix things on their own. And so getting feedback from innovators is very challenging as well. So, for example, if you're rolling out a new learning system or a new electronic medical record system and you have innovators and they sort of volunteer uh, to help you out, they'll jump into the system, they'll try to figure things out, uh, but they're not very forthcoming with information. They feel as if it's their job to get things done. And so even though you're, you have this very uh, important part of your population, my suggestion is when you do this first, and by the way, when you first roll these out and you have it open, by definition, those people that log in first are self-identifying as innovators. You also want to make sure that you reach out to them and draw um, the information that you're looking for uh, about the system, you know, any pitfalls, any things that you think you need to fix along the way. We now move on to early adopters. Early adopters are very similar innovators, but they're a little more judicious. They have a little more uh, discreet levels of, of judgment. Uh, they, have, they have what's called high opinion leadership. So if, if you're trying to get a pulse in your culture, these are the kind of people that you want to talk to. You want to, they, they're the ones that are in the know on what people think and, and, and what they think about the new system, what they think about trends, uh, and they're highly connected to, to the innovators. So they're getting really good data real time, but they also have sort of this level of judiciousness when it pertains to connecting to the technology. And so what you want to do there is you want to make sure that you understand some of their concerns and address those concerns ahead of time. So you can see as we sort of divide up the world into these five buckets, there are actions that you can take as you roll out your new EMR. And, and I would suggest that any training or learning system that you utilize should have these features and functions to be able to draw information and, and gather that, that information for your use. So now you have about 16% and we're going to cross that chasm. We're going to move from folks that like the scarcity, like the exclusivity, that those that are looking for social proof. And early majority, those are the ones that have the, uh, the, the, the 
sensitivity to social proof. They don't necessarily have an opinion leadership. They're kind of sort of the me too. They, they kind of have to be uh, held um, by the hand. And so what you want to do there specifically when rolling out any system is you want to be more specific with them as to what it is that they need to do. They're very compliant. Once they know that that 16% has been connected to the system, that you're hearing stories, right? So the idea of social proof is you're going back to your innovators and early adopters. You're trying to get those case studies. You're trying to get the, the little sound bite. And you publish those sound bites of success to your early majority. They hear those things and say, well, if 16% if of the company is doing this or the, the institution or the hospital is doing these things, maybe it's good enough for me as well. And so you have the greatest level of rise and in inflection, meaning from the, the rate of adoption at that point when you transition to that 34% of the early majority. You now move to having over 50% of your population engaged in adopting that technology. You now move into that late majority. They're the kind of people that are actually going to wait to feel as if the better part of the organization is utilizing this new uh, tech, uh, this new technology. They certainly have a high level of skepticism. It's still healthy, but they're going to have to be coaxed a little bit more. So what are some of the techniques you could use there is not only have that social proof from different places, but you now want to have the opportunity to uh, if you will, have breadcrumbs, if you will, maybe micro-learning videos, maybe uh, FAQs, um, uh, higher levels of monitoring as to how you can help, uh, daily types of engagement tools, observational checklists, um, all of these kinds of things that make the late majority feel as if they're being catered to uh, to utilize the system. In addition, you may want to go back to those 25 issues that I stated overall a, a couple slides ago and start addressing those specifically. Those issues probably came mostly from the late majority, right, because they're looking for excuses to not have to change. And then lastly, you get to the laggards. They're just aver – they have aversion to change. They're traditionalist. Um, they feel as if – uh, the purity of healthcare is being violated, and there's no room for technology. My suggestion at this point is you need to manage those that have these characteristics by exception. So note that don't get caught up on the fact that you still have 16% to close out. You have gained the other 84% of people that are now utilizing the system. I often advise uh, my customers and, and clients that once you achieve somewhere between 80 and 90 percent adoption, you're pretty much done in any proactive change management that you need uh, and that you now have to deal with the leftover in a, in a by exception. And again, I would suggest to go back to those 25 points I made earlier that would give you uh, – a, a, a understanding of some of the challenges or arguably artificial excuses that some of these folks may bring up. So as we wrap up this session, I've given you a lot of information and a lot of a lot of stuff for you to think about. It's still a challenge out there, like any new technology you would find, but I believe the stakes are very high. It is, we have to have an understanding that electronic medical records, or in this case, electronic health records, are critical to improving patient care. We know that the previous administration and this current administration continue to put regulations and pressure on the healthcare industry to really move the quality of patient care up the scale. And EMRs are one of the tools that will make that happen. We also have to have an understanding that there's still low adoption amongst physicians, that they are the key 
to making health records a viable solution to better patient care. And we must listen to them, create those mitigation steps that I talked about earlier to be able to increase that adoption. We also know that we took a look at those 25 issues that have been brought up, and they really boil down to two basic themes, training themes and operation themes. They're the main barriers for complete adoption of this technology, and training means sort of that traditional training where we're exchanging information, we're, we're assessing, and we're providing uh, the skills and behaviors required to be successful, and then there's obviously a place for operations where we want to expand on our procedures, policies, uh, as well as prioritization. I call them the three Ps of operations uh, to remove that barrier. And lastly, something that we can do very quickly and right out of the gate is to have a strong training process. That will go a long way towards EMR adoption. The idea that we can remove some of the barriers around computer literacy, understanding the purpose for EMRs, when to use them, and, and in essence have uh, that training material at, those, at their fingertips to be reminded on how to do something only creates the confidence that they need uh, in this particular tool. So with that, I conclude this particular session. I appreciate everybody's time and attention. I, I am hopeful that it was beneficial uh, as you revisit or visit uh, for the first time the adoption of EMRs. And at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Amy for any questions that we may have. Thanks, Tom. That was a very enlightening presentation. Uh, we do have a few minutes left and several questions. We'll answer as many questions as possible in the time that we have now, and we'll email the answers to any remaining questions after this webinar. So here's the first question, Tom. Are there other technology issues that clinicians are encountering which we haven't yet discussed, and what are they? Yeah, that's a very interesting question because I, I, I try to maintain in the, in the current topic, which is that of, of EMRs, but if you think about healthcare data overall, and the, how technology continues to advance. I, I'd like to, to start with a little bit of a story. I, 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 I went to one of these uh, health days uh, where you, you, you go to a particular area and, and you can get your cholesterol tested and you can get your bone density tested and your cardiovascular uh, system tested. And so I went through this battery of, of tests all at one place. and. And, and they had, it was a, a kind of a community center set up, and I went to one post, and they did this, uh, my cholesterol, all that, and then I went to my bone density post, and yet I did not see anybody um, taking any notes, and so finally, you know, being the person that I am in this particular field, I had to ask the question, and they said, well, all of these systems are all interconnected, so we know, we type in your, your patient ID, and all this information is now gathered, and so at the end of it, we'll summarize a report. So when we think about electronic medical records, we think of computer screens and forms that we sit down and we would type stuff into. Uh, in the year 2018, if I may, uh, that is not necessarily the case. So machines that take your cholesterol, machines that take your... Uh, your bone density, machines that look at your cardiovascular systems are also medical record input machines. And so if you start looking at that spectrum, you can quickly get overwhelmed with all of the places that your specific medical record information is being kept. And uh, I would love to someday dive into that discussion, but you can see how uh, this is only going to be more pervasive in this field. Mm, that is very interesting. Um, here's another question that came in. What are hospitals doing to ensure that clinicians have the training they need in order to pop properly use uh, the EMR in their practice? Well, I'd be remiss to say that 
that it that everybody is into the 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 challenges that I explained today. There's certainly lots of hospitals out there that are doing an excellent job utilizing health records and having uh, the adoption that they need from their practitioners uh, within the hospital. But there are other areas that um, that I see hospitals working on. Uh, one of them is becoming more intentional about the purpose of what it, medical records are about. Initially, medical records were viewed as something that needed to be done, and it was a compliant thing. It was almost more of a uh, of yet another administrative tool that uh, practitioners needed to adhere to. And like anything else, we always get to sort of this bad taste in our mouth with those kinds of things. I mean, I, I think of any of the standard um, compliance training that you may do in, in your particular workplace. Uh, these usually are not necessarily agreeable things or certainly not fun. And I think that was one of the initial challenges. Those that are successful are changing that perspective and are making it more to the point of why it is that many of these people have chosen healthcare as their profession, which is to take care of people. This is especially true with, with nurses. Nurses have a very strong empathetic uh, trait uh, in them. They got into the business because they want to take care of people. And if you can equate this technology directly to that mission, you will see greater levels of adoption. So I've seen uh, different types of, of, shall I say, commercials internally about how tools like this can save people's lives. I, I would think the story I told about Leilani and Gabriel is very powerful to tell and wakes people up a little bit when I do tell that story. And um, I'll see a lot of that kind of uh, information and sort of advertisement within hospitals uh, to, to move the needle. That, yeah, that is a very important thing to keep in mind. Uh, okay, so what are health, health systems currently not doing that they should be doing in order to increase EMR adoption? Well, not to not to sort of skirt that that uh, that question, but it, arguably it's the other side of the coin that I just mentioned. Uh, they're not connecting to the purpose. Uh, they they are selling, if you will, and I use that in air quotes. Um, they are selling these systems as being compliant systems. Um, often I'll, I'll hear, and, and again, I, I do a lot of sort of uh, locational research where I actually talk to nurses and doctors about these kinds of things, and. Uh, Sometimes you will get that message from hospital administration that says, you know, thou shall do this and thou shall do that. And I don't know if you ever walk down the hallway of a hospital, and, and uh, I don't necessarily hope that anyone does because the hospital is the last place to get well. But if you were to walk down the hallway, you see a lot of bulletin boards. And, and, and it's interesting. I always like to see what those bulletin boards say. And I'm talking about like within the nurse's station or the places like that. And if you see sort of inspirational things connected to the tools, you will see that people uh, will adhere to the tools more so and adopt those. However, I've seen lots of hospitals where those bulletin boards are filled with compliance numbers, scores, ratings, benchmarks, almost like they're being watched and that they have to adhere to an artificial process more so than looking at patient care. And for those hospitals, I would strongly suggest that you rethink uh, that punitive view of utilizing EMR and the associated training tools and look at it more from one that is uh, actually expanding people's missions. So don't overlook the emotional and psychological component of that communication. Yes, absolutely. Agreed. Okay. Uh, last question is uh, for hospital systems that do want to increase EMR adoptions, what are your recommendations for the first steps they should take? I think I think the the pervasive theme that I continue to to talk not only in this webinar but when I talk to customers and clients and and others that want to know is you really want to connect all of this to mission and purpose. 
what I find very interesting with the population, meaning uh, of clinicians, those that have chosen this as their profession, uh, they they have highly empathetic traits. They have a great concern for uh, those next to them that need their help, and and that's why they got into the business. As a matter of fact. One of the presentations that I've done in the past around the shortage of nurses suggests that uh, the reason we have nurse shortage is not because we don't have enough people wanting to be nurses, but we don't have enough people to train them. And the reason we don't have enough people to train them is because clinicians, nurses do not want to get a degree and, and credentials to treat somebody only to go back into the classroom and train others. They rather be out there hands on helping people. And so may I may I continue to sort of harp on this and get on my soapbox to say hospitals, organizations, those that are in the healthcare business Make sure that what you do in any of these technological tools, but certainly health records as we talk about it today, continues to be connected to the purpose of patient health and a better society. Well, that's great. Thank you. Well, that's all the time we have today. I'd like to thank our speaker, Tom Tonkin, and our audience for joining us. Shortly, you will receive an email with instructions to access the on-demand recording of this webinar, as well as answers to your questions. Thank you all for joining us. Have a great day.